Cholelithiasis is a common disease in the United States. About 90 to 95 percent of cases of acute cholecystitis are going to be gallstone related biliary tract obstruction and ultrasound is going to be your imaging modality of choice in these patients. Now evaluation of the biliary tract can be quite challenging. It's going to include evaluation of the liver for intrahepatic ductal dilatation. It's going to include evaluation of the gallbladder, its neck, and it's also going to include evaluation of the common bile duct. For those of you who don't know, this is Willie Sutton, a famous bank robber from over 100 years ago, and he's famous for having said that he robs banks because that's where the money is. What we're going to be doing on the focused entry-level gallbladder exam is focusing directly on the sonographic findings of the gallbladder. This is going to be much easier to interpret and to perform at the beginning level then to try and teach common bile duct evaluation. We'll be teaching that at a later point, but early on it's unrealistic to expect that you're going to grasp both evaluate, the ability to evaluate the gallbladder as well as the intra and extrahepatic ductal systems. So an important point to remember here is that the decision for operative management should only be made after the CBD has been evaluated because up to 15 to 18 percent of patients who sonographically have cholecystitis will also have cholecystitis, and the operative intervention is going to be different for cholecystitis versus cholecystitis. Cholecystitis, these patients will get their gallbladder out. Patients with cholecystitis will have an ERCP for CBD, CBD stone extraction followed by um, cholecystectomy. Now let's first look at the sagittal gallbladder exam. Let's look at exam essentials. In terms of transducers, you're going to use a 2 to 5 megahertz curvilinear or phased array transducer. I prefer using a large footprint curvilinear transducer for these exams. In terms of patient position, I initially start the patient off in the supine position, but if I see a stone, I'm going to have to do the exam in two positions, to, especially if the stone is by the neck, to confirm that the stone is mobile and not obstructing the neck. So I'll usually do supine and then left lateral decubitus position. In terms of prep preparation, ideally patients should be MPO, but in the ED on the symptomatic or the suspected symptomatic patient, the exam should be performed regardless of their prandial status. Here's an example of the right upper quadrant sagittal window going from lateral to medial. So here we're starting off, we see the liver, so this is anterior, posterior, head and foot, here's the diaphragm, here's the right pleural space here, here you've got the kidney. So as we move the transducer medially, we're now going to bring the gallbladder into view, and here you can see the fundus of the gallbladder, and here you can see its neck. It's really important that you, when evaluating the gallbladder, make subtle manipulation so that you can evaluate the neck because this is where the pathologic stones are going to reside. When scanning the gallbladder in a sagittal plane, it's always important to look for the main lobar fissure because this is a fixed anatomic relationship. The right portal vein is connected to the gallbladder by the main lobar fissure. So there's going to be times that you look at um, other anechoic appearing structures in the right upper quadrant and you may think to yourself, am I looking at the gallbladder? Try and identify the main lobar fissure and its relationship to the right portal vein. This will help you to confirm that what you're looking at is indeed the gallbladder. What if you're scanning and you can't find the gallbladder? All you see is this. You're as close um, to the sub or the the sub uh, this um, the costal margin is possible, and you still can't see the gallbladder. All you see is this dirty shadowing from bowel gas. What you should do is have the patient take in a deep breath. And there you go. Now you can see liver, and you can see gallbladder here. Remember, anything that's close to the diaphragm is going to be affected by respiration. Here, having the patient take in a deep breath 
will help you in visualizing the gallbladder. What if you still can't find the gallbladder, but you're actually able to see the liver? Now you got to be thinking of other potential causes. One is that the gallbladder is absent. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy scars are not as obvious as the old open scars were, and sometimes patients forget that they had their gallbladder out, and you're looking and you don't see anything, and it's because it's surgically absent. Another option is that the gallbladder could be contracted. Here's portal vein here, here's main lobar fissure, and this is a completely contracted gallbladder in someone who had just eaten. The other possibility is that the gallbladder is filled with stones, and I'll show some examples of that in a little bit here, and it's possible that the, lastly, that the patient could have an ectopic location for their gallbladder. Here are some examples of contracted gallbladders, and these can be very difficult to find, especially in the beginning stages of your career. So again, you're going to have to rely heavily on the main lobar fissure and the anatomic association with the right portal vein. If we look here, here's another patient who had just eaten, and you can see there's still some bile within the lumen here. This will make it easier to see, but um, this gallbladder is contracted because the patient had just eaten. But again, you can see main lobar fissure, gallbladder was over here, there's right portal vein. So I'm comfortable in this relationship right here that I can confirm that this is indeed the gallbladder. Here's an example here of a patient whose gallbladder is filled with uh, stones. So as we're scanning along, here we've got the right portal, here's the main lobar fissure, so we know the gallbladder is coming up. And here's what we see is, here's a gallbladder, it's partially contracted, here's a large echogenic stone, we see the clean shadowing behind it. Here we see a little bit of bile. But as we you know, look at it again, this is one that could be potentially missed by the beginning scanner. So you're going to be looking for clean shadowing here. This is not what you would expect from bowel gas. And so this would be your first clue that this is the gallbladder here and that this is just a very large stone within there. What about the transverse exam? Whether you start in the sagittal or the transverse planes is a personal preference. I like to start sagittally, but I know some of my peers start off in the transverse plane, so whatever works for you is fine. If you start off in the transverse plane, you're going to be in the subcostal region at about the midclavicular line, indicators towards the patient's right. So you've got anterior, posterior, patient's right, patient's left. Here you've got liver. Here you've got the right kidney. The gallbladder is going to be anterior and medial to the superior pole of the right kidney. Here's a transverse exam, um, a sweep going from the cephalad region caudally. So as we start off, here you can see the gallbladder. Now we're moving down towards the fundus. And as we come back up, this is going to be the gallbladder neck here. On patients who have an S-shaped gallbladder or a relatively tortuous neck, I think it's easier to follow the neck in the transverse plane as we're seeing here. So you can see there's the neck going into the fundus. For a couple examples of contracted gallbladders in the transverse plane, here you can see the wall here and here you can see the lumen, but there's essentially no bile in there. Here you can see on this transverse, there's a little bit of bile in there, making it easier to conclude that this is a gallbladder. But you can see that it's you know significantly contracted. And this was also a patient who had just eaten. Here's a transverse sweep of a patient whose gallbladder is filled with stones. So really what you're going to be looking for and what may catch your eye first is this clean shadowing. Let's look now at how we can evaluate the gallbladder with ultrasound. Ideally, the gallbladder has been described as being oval or pear-shaped, and you can see that here. This has a nice oval or pear shape to it, but there's going to be a lot of variations to the shape of the gallbladder, and you need to be aware of this when scanning the right upper quadrant. Here are examples of Phrygian caps 
and these are folds in the fundus of the gallbladder. So this is, these are both sagittal views here of the gallbladder, and you can see here's a fold in the fundus right here. This is called a pharyngean cap, although not very common. Here you've got a gallbladder that has multiple septations within it. This theoretically poses an increased risk for gallstone development. And here you've got an example of some junctional folds on these sagittal views down by the neck. Here you can see one, and here you can see a fold right here. So these are actually very common. What are gallstones going to look like? Unless they're impacted, they're going to be mobile. So remember, if you see gallstones, especially by the neck, you got to do the exam in two positions to confirm mobility. They're going to be echogenic and they're going to cast clean acoustical shadows. So here you have a gallbladder that has multiple echogenic stones with clean shadowing behind it. There's a sludge ball, however, sitting up on top here, but these are all gallstones. Hi, I'm Dr. Robert Jones and welcome to the introductory abdominal ultrasound lecture. When evaluating the gallbladder, I like to use the tissue harmonics feature because I think that this allows for crisper appearances of the wall and it also produces nicer um, and cleaner posterior, posterior shadowing. Here we've got the same patient, same scanning time, and all I did was here was add tissue harmonics. This is without tissue harmonics. I think that the wall borders are more discernible and I think that the shadowing is more readily apparent and the gallstones are more echogenic. Will even tiny gallstones shadow? If you've got your settings correct that you're using the highest frequency and you've got your focal zones assigned to the right level, gallstones greater than three millimeters should cast posterior shadowing. Here we've got a stone here that was not casting any shadowing, but all these other ones were. This stone measured under three millimeters. And so keep in mind that if you've got very tiny stones, they may not cast posterior shadowing. Visual, visualizing the neck is gonna be essential because this is where the obstruction is gonna occur. So you've gotta make sure that you do gentle, you know, twisting movements in order to bring out the neck. Here was a patient that had Clinically, a sonographic Murphy's, the uh, resident came and got me, said that they couldn't find a gallstone, but they were pretty tender over that spot, and the gallbladder appeared enlarged. So I looked at their clip as they swept through, and they really weren't seeing the neck, but the patient was exquisitely tender right over that point, and it made us very suspicious that this patient did have a gallstone obstructing down in the neck. So I went ahead and scanned the patient, and by gently you know, twisting the transducer and allowing visualization of the neck, I was able to see that there was this stone sitting here, and I moved the patient into several other positions and was unable to get this stone to free up. So this was the reason for the patient's pain right here, and all it took was some subtle twisting of the transducer in order to bring out better visualization of the neck but it's essential that you visualize the gallbladder neck. If you're having a hard time in the sagittal plane, remember, go in the transverse plane. It's easier to sweep up and down and visualize from the fundus all the way to the neck. In the literature, you'll see um, the term west complex used, and that means wall echo shadow. And that's what you're gonna see when you've got the gallbladder that's packed with multiple stones or one large stone that you have the wall, the echo, and the shadow here. And basically on this patient here, you really don't see any bile. It's just the wall, the echo, and the shadow. What about sludge? Sludge is either cholesterol or calcium bilirubinate, uh, or, cal or cholesterol crystals or calcium bilirubinate granules. They're gonna be echogenic. They're not gonna shadow, and they'll be mobile. You'll see a changing position as the patient uh, you know, goes from supine to left lateral decubitus to right lateral decubitus position. Here's a patient that came in, had right upper quadrant pain. You look here, you can see the gallbladder in a sagittal plane, you can see it in the transverse plane. The gallbladder does not have the nice 
anechoic lumen that you would expect. There's layered echogenic area here. There's no posterior shadowing, and this was mobile as the patient turned from position to position. This is consistent with something such as sludge. But is sludge the only possibility? As we got further history from this patient, they had recently had a liver biopsy, and so this is actually hemobilia. So it's important to remember clotted blood will have the same appearance as sludge. This is the same thing you're, uh, theme you're going to see when you're doing soft tissue ultrasound. Ultrasound will not help you differentiate a hematoma from an abscess. It's not going to help you in the pelvis to distinguish clotted hemoperitoneum from pus. So just keep that in mind. Briefly, let me talk about gallbladder polyps. The primary goal in the management of gallbladder polyps is to prevent the development of gallbladder carcinoma. So who's high risk for developing gallbladder carcinoma? Someone who's got a solitary polyp greater than six millimeters with an age greater than 50 years old is high risk for malignancy. If polyps are not gonna be removed via cholecystectomy, then they need to be followed by serial exam. And it's important to keep that in mind. Polyps are gonna be echogenic areas within the lumen. They're not gonna be mobile and they should not cast uh, shadowing. But if you see these as incidental findings, you wanna make sure that you refer the patient for follow-up. What about air within the lumen? I'm always harping on recognize reverberations when you see them. Air in the wrong place is never good. While emphysematous cholecystitis accounts for less than 1% of all cases, these are usually more advanced cases and these patients can be sicker. Here's the CT here. You can see that there's a large amount of air anteriorly here within the gallbladder. And on ultrasound, you can see that there are multiple echogenic areas here with posterior reverberations all consistent with the presence of air. This is something you want to be able to diagnose. Here's a patient that came in with right upper quadrant pain. The intern that was uh, scanning was having a hard time identifying the gallbladder. And when they were scanning in this area right here, they saw all this dirty shadowing and reverberations here. They saw this echogenic line right here, but they assumed that this was just bowel gas. You can see here that this is bile right here. If you look transversely, anterior and medial to the uh, superior pole of the right kidney, here you've got the gallbladder. Here you've got air within the gallbladder lumen. You've got stones here. And you can see intermittently there's little echogenic foci moving up to the surface here. Those are uh, gas bubbles from the gas forming infection. You can see him moving up right there. This was a patient with emphysematous cholecystitis. Although the clip I have here sagittally doesn't confirm it, we were, on other views were able to confirm that this area connected via the main lobar fissure down here over to the right portal vein. So remember, if you see these echogenic areas with posterior reverbs, be ready to make the diagnosis of emphysematous cholecystitis. Does size matter? And the answer is yes. Um, a gallbladder with a transverse diameter, outer wall to outer wall, that's greater than four to five centimeters, that uh, should uh, raise your suspicion of cholecystitis. Sagittally, the gallbladder should be less than 10 centimeters. However, this number does not correlate as well as the transverse width measurement does. But here's a caveat. The absence of dilatation does not exclude the presence of obstruction, particularly early on in the timeline. Can gallbladder wall thickness help you? Sure, but in conjunction with other findings, not by itself. Normal wall thickness, and this should be measured anteriorly, you don't want to do it posteriorly because it's difficult to discern the gallbladder wall and the bowel borders. It's easier to do it up here with the liver, um, but normally the thickness should be less than three millimeters. However, wall thickening is a nonspecific finding. 
You don't have to memorize a list, but just in case you didn't believe me, the differential is pretty extensive for gallbladder wall thickening. So alone, gallbladder wall thickening cannot be used to make the diagnosis of cholecystitis. Here's a patient with end stage, end stage AIDS. She had hepatitis, and she also had multiple intra-abdominal pseudomonal abscesses. If you look at her gallbladder, she did not have acute biliary disease. But if you look, she's got massive thickening of the walls. And on transverse, you can see that there's massive thickening of the walls, but this was not due to acute cholecystitis. Here's a patient that had gallbladder wall thickening. If you take a look here, here's the wall here, but here's also a wall. It's not uncommon to see in the mid portion a central hypoechoic area. Now, at first glance, you may want to look and say, ooh, here's gallbladder wall, this is pericholecystic fluid, but you really want to trace the whole outline of the gallbladder. This was the outer wall here of the gallbladder wall, or the outer portion of the gallbladder wall. This was just some edema in the mid portion here, so there was no pericholecystic fluid, just wall thickening. We talked about this on the FAST exam lecture, that free fluid is going to butt up against adjacent structures and give you these triangular corners. And you can see here, there is pericholecystic fluid here coming up. And you can see it's got no wall around it, and it's got nice triangular corners. It's important to remember that pericholecystic fluid can be of <clears throat> biliary or non-biliary origin. So remember then, pericholecystic fluid can be a nonspecific finding. In the literature, it's defined as broken down into type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is going to be a thin anechoic crescent-shaped collection. Type 2 is going to be a round or irregularly shaped collection. Here you can see a triangular-shaped fluid collection here between the kidney and the gallbladder. Here you can see that this gallbladder is enlarged. It's greater than 5 centimeters. There's multiple stones here, and there's pericholecystic fluid. This patient also had a sonographic Murphy sign and was diagnosed as acute cholecystitis. The CBD had been visualized prior to the patient going to the operating room, and it was normal in size. We're going to talk about the common bile duct evaluation in future modules. So how can just looking at the gallbladder alone help you? Well, if you got a patient that comes in, right upper quadrant pain, if you look at the literature, 43% of the time when we suspect somebody has acute cholecystitis or symptomatic biliary disease, we're wrong. If you look and you see that a patient has a normal gallbladder, there's an absence of stones, absence of wall thickening, no pericholecystic fluid, and a sonographic Murphy, an absence of a sonographic Murphy sign, this essentially rules out the diagnosis of acute biliary disease. Let me just spend a second clarifying the sonographic Murphy sign. By definition, it's reproducible point tenderness directly over the gallbladder with transducer pressure. It's 87% specific for the diagnosis of cholecystitis, and the presence of gallstones in combination with a positive sonographic Murphy sign has a 92% positive predictive value for the diagnosis of acute cholecystitis. But it really has to be reproducible point tenderness, not global tenderness over the right upper quadrant, including the gallbladder, point tenderness directly over the gallbladder. What if you have the patient who you do find gallstones and they have focal tenderness, meaning a sonographic Murphy sign? You got to remember here that up to 18% of these patients will also have associated CBD stones and therefore operative intervention should not be planned until you have a comprehensive exam done where the common bile duct is evaluated.